to say, no, we don't want to see an, another coal plant that would poison this community for 50 years be built. We don't want to have an increase in greenhouse gas emissions when we need to decrease it. And each time, we organized. We knocked on doors. We held town hall meetings. We worked to build community forums to talk about alternatives to pollution. And we prevailed time and time and time and time again. In this country's history, the progress that we've made socially uh, and environmentally almost always starts where we are overmatched. It almost always starts in an instance where the community underdogs have to prevail against more powerful, what seem like more powerful opponents. So, hello and welcome to Cambridge Forum in Harvard Square, and thank you for joining us on this warm September evening to discuss a topic dear to all of our hearts, the precarious future of America's public lands, national parks, monuments, and wilderness. Most of us could never have imagined the scenario we currently find ourselves in, fighting to defend what we considered to be the rock-solid permanent underpinning of our national heritage, sacred sites like the Grand Canyon. But here we are. The first year of Trump's administration is widely regarded as a disaster on multiple levels. But for environmentalists and those who love nature, it is considered to be the worst period for America parks and public lands in history. Trump has opened the gates for miners, drillers, loggers, and grazers to come and plunder federal public lands to potentially privatize what we thought had been prized and protected for their own individual exploitation and profit. Bruce Babbitt, the former US Interior Secretary, warned that our entire public land heritage may soon be up for sale. And he hoped that Stephen Nash's book would awaken all Americans to this unprecedented threat. I'm Mary Stack, director of Cambridge Forum, and tonight we are fortunate to have with us Stephen Nash, the author of the book in question, Grand Canyon for Sale, Public Lands versus Private Interests, and also Michael Brune, the executive director of the Sierra Club. Before we begin, I'd like to encourage you all to participate in the discussion which follows the presentation and then stay for the book sale, which is organized by Harvard Bookstore. Stephen Nash is the author of two award-winning books on science and the environment. His work has appeared in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Bioscience, and the New Republic. He is currently visiting senior research scholar at the University of Richmond, and when I first spoke to Stephen, I just finished reading his poignant piece in the New York Times about the threatened Bears Ears Monument in Utah. His article was entitled, Heated Politics and Precious Ruins. Yet despite the depressing picture he painted, he told me that hopeless is pointless. To explain what he meant by that and to discuss his latest book, please welcome Stephen Nash. Well, I'm honored to be here. Thanks for that generous introduction, and thanks to all of you for coming out this evening. Before I begin my remarks, though, I want to acknowledge a problem that, uh, that we have. Actually, better said, it's a problem that you may well have with me. We live in an era when we can pluck things off the internet and assemble them into a, a picture of reality. And your picture and my picture aren't going to be the same. So what real reason do you have to think that the picture I'm going to be showing you tonight is reasonably complete and is accurate? In order to address that problem, I want to present three credentials from my professional portfolio. And the first one's probably pretty obvious. I think you should believe what I have to say because I'm old. And the second reason that you're not wasting your time tonight is probably becoming obvious, I'm loud. But if those aren't sufficient, uh, the third reason, I hope it's the clincher, is that I am a journalist. That's supposed to be a big applause line, ladies, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, but okay. Um, <laughs> 
Sometimes it's a laugh line, you never know. Uh, but be that as it may, I'm here tonight to provide a picture for you of public lands uh, and a kind of an update. They include our national parks, of course, that we're all very familiar with, but public lands also include our national forests, our wilderness areas, wildlife refuges, our national rangelands and grasslands. And you may be surprised to hear that taken together, these account for almost a third of the land area of the United States, something over a million square miles. It's also true, especially if you live east of the Mississippi, that most of us don't know very much about those other public lands. But I address you tonight as their owners, because all of us are the holders of the deeds of trust for all of these public lands, whether it's the Great Meadows National Wildlife Refuge here in Massachusetts, or the Berryessa Snow Mountain National Monument out in California. All of us collectively set the rules that govern the future of these public lands as a matter of national policy. Well, you might ask, so what? If your daily agenda includes nuclear standoffs and terrorist threats and Russian trolls and Donald Trump and more Trump, how much room do you really have for concern about public lands? Why would you pay attention to a faulty light switch when the roof is on fire? So allow me to make the case that public lands are worth your curiosity and your surveillance and perhaps even your engagement because they're part of that burning roof and because we can no longer take their safety for granted. Their habitat, as most of us know, at least from photographs, for a range of wonderful, charismatic, photogenic species, for jaguar and wolves and grizzly bears, uh, for antelope and condors. These are all animals that are under a great deal of pressure. Many of their populations are diminishing. But also, public lands are habitat for thousands of species of plants and animals that we never hear about. Public lands are biologically rich and often very scenic. And the way we choose to manage that land uh, will be crucial for increasing their odds of survival. All, all of those plants and animals, especially with the advance of what many scientists are encouraging us to call climate disruption rather than just climate change. But know that this is not just a conversation about wild species. Public lands are also playing an essential role in our own well-being, and I'd like to offer you just a couple of examples of why that is. Let's start with air pollution. And I'm not referring to smog, but to storms of airborne topsoil. You know, it hasn't been long since we learned the lesson that natural resources like soil can easily be squandered. Western public lands, they're semi-arid, many of them, and in the 1930s, they were often overplowed and overgrazed, and they were one factor in what became our national environmental catastrophe, we remember it now as the Dust Bowl. Billowing clouds of dirt blackened the skies periodically for years, even as far east as Washington, D.C. That's 2,000 miles to the east, where one U.S. senator said that those dust clouds were the most tragic and the most impressive lobbyists ever to visit this capital. That led to some restraints on grazing, but these days, ruinous overgrazing of Western public lands continues, and they are leased mainly to extremely wealthy cattle industrialists, not to picturesque ranchers in cowboy hats that are often trotted out for uh, photo opportunities. Is this really such a big thing? How much land are we talking about? Public lands grazing occupies a land area equivalent of Massachusetts, New York, New Jersey, Virginia, West Virginia, Ohio, Indiana, Pennsylvania, South Carolina, Maine, and the state of Washington. I think I remembered them all. 
That's 378,000 square miles of publicly owned grazing leases. And those leases are a bargain, by the way. You can feed a cow and a calf for a month on our land for less than you'd pay to feed your goldfish. But even the federal agency that administers most of that grazing land admits that at least a quarter of it is unhealthy because of overgrazing. And another third of it, about 100,000 square miles, they don't even know what shape that land is in. And with the droughts and the heat of climate disruption, resource managers have told me that the loss of topsoil to wind and other kinds of erosion is accelerating. Also, grazing heavily, heavily pollutes the scarce water supplies in the West, and as you can imagine, it thoroughly displaces wildlife habitat. What would happen if we stopped all this destructive grazing on our land? Well, we wouldn't run short of hamburgers. Public lands grazing only accounts for 1% of our national supply of beef. And we'd save a lot of money because it costs six times more to administer these grazing programs than they bring in income. And of course, the ecosystem losses are staggering, so we would save a great deal on that account too. Healthy and protected public lands are also crucial for water quality. A primary reason for the establishment of the National Forest System a hundred or so years ago was that those forests, many of them had vanished in both eastern and western states. That was true in the White Mountains National Forest where my wonderful wife Linda, who's uh, with us here tonight, and I have been hiking for the last few days. In fact, 2018 is the centennial year for the establishment of that forest, which was heavily logged, even on the steepest slopes, and 10% of it has burned because of irresponsible and unregulated logging. Where I live in the southeast, there are a dozen national forests, all of which had uh, been burned and logged and sometimes plowed to ruin for the same reason. So, with widespread political support, we created the National Forest System in an uh, effort to bring those lands back to health. Because the slopes were denuded of forests, topsoil, mud washed into reservoirs and, and threatened public water supplies in many places. Up here, the rivers, including the Merrimack River, were flooded with mud. Um, it was havoc for industry and also threatened water supplies. A lot of that situation has improved. It's uh, still a work in progress, but our forests are obviously in much healthier shape now. In fact, these days, 20% of our national supply of clean water depends on our national forests and grasslands. But the major reason why we have to keep federal lands intact is climate. I'd like you to bring to mind the vaguely rectangular outline of Yellowstone National Park in northwestern Wyoming. Yellowstone is part of what has been called the spine of the continent. It's the long arc of the Rocky Mountains north to south. Like Acadia National Park or Yosemite or Great Smoky Mountains National Park, the climate of Yellowstone is changing. In fact, that's true of every natural area across the whole North American continent. In effect, as the climate heats up, it's moving Yellowstone's climate to the south, to hotter and hotter places, so that by the middle of this century, that's just 30 years from now, Climate physicists have projected that Yellowstone's climate will have moved to a much hotter place, several hundred miles, to the climate that has been uh, the climate of northern Utah. If we continue putting greenhouse gas emissions into the atmosphere at the current rates, those same projections tell us that Yellowstone's climate will move another couple of hundred miles south by the end of the century to southern Utah. Yosemite, Grand Canyon National Park, by then their climates will be as hot as the climate has been along the Mexican border. What happens to the ecosystems, the plants and animals in all these places as the heat accumulates rapidly? Well, the hope is that they can adapt by migrating north 
through open lands to stay within the envelope of climate that they have evolved to survive within. But that can only happen if there are open public lands for them to migrate through. From places like Chiricahua National Monument on the southern border of Arizona, right on the Mexican border actually, all the way up to Glacier National Park on the border of Canada. Most of the public lands puzzle pieces in those broad swaths of open migration possibility, most of them are not national parks. They're those other less heard of public lands, although the national parks are obviously very important. Those are the pathways of survival through migration, but they only work if those lands are connected and protected. What we need to do actually is turn them into something like one big national park. Wildlife ecologists who are trying to come to grips with the impacts of climate change in the future tell us that connectivity is a critical need. If the connections are severed instead, and if those public lands are open to more mechanized recreation, more fracking, more mining and drilling, then they can't function any longer as support systems. So there's a momentous opportunity here for us in public lands if we're able to pursue it. But public lands also represent a very rich target of opportunity for a broad array of private corporate interests and their political allies. 2010 is uh, also the centennial year not 2010, excuse me, 2019 will be the centennial year for the creation of Grand Canyon National Park. And it's a reminder that, as with so many places, that park was only protected after a fight. It was President Theodore Roosevelt, with broad support in Congress, who withstood ferocious opposition from the forces of privatization to see it through and get that national park protected. So this isn't a problem that began with the current presidency. But those forces have now become so strident that in the 2016 campaign platform of the Republican Party, there was support for the dismemberment of our federal land heritage. Let me quote briefly from that platform. Congress shall immediately pass universal legislation providing for a timely and orderly mechanism requiring the federal government to convey certain federally controlled public lands to the states. Some states are eager to get into this game. A few years ago, the Arizona legislature passed a bill that said on, on or before December 31st, the United States shall extinguish title to all public lands in Arizona and transfer title to this state. That would have included all of the national forests, the um, national monuments, refuges, wilderness areas, and of course, and not least, Grand Canyon National Park. And by the way, the bill also specified that the state had the right to sell off those new acquisitions to private parties as it chose. Fortunately, the bill was vetoed by the governor. She was a Tea Party Republican, and apparently it was too crazy for her. Clearly, though, the momentum is toward breaking up and liquidating public lands rather than connecting them and protecting them. As things now stand, the current administration is revising the rules governing public lands to, in unprecedented assaults. It has already vandalized 10 national monuments, and two of the largest of them, Mary mentioned one of them, Bears Ears National Monument. The other one is Grand Staircase Escalante National Monument. They're both in southern Utah, and each of them is far larger than Grand Canyon National Park. The Trump administration has declared its intention to reduce the size of one of those monuments by 85% and the other one by 50%. That's all being litigated in federal court and we'll see how things turn out. But no wonder public lands are coveted by some of us as a private piggy bank rather than a national treasure. 
And no wonder the lobbying to open them up to more exploitation is so relentless. I mentioned how cheaply we let the cattle industry lease our public rangelands. But hard rock mining corporations, many of them Australian, Chinese, British, or Canadian, they have their own cookie jar. They operate under a 150-year-old National Mining Act. It was passed during the Ulysses Grant administration. And it specifies that billions of dollars of mineral wealth can be extracted from our land without paying us a cent in royalty. The oil and gas drillers have their own sweet deal. They pay us less to lease an acre of our land for a year than you and I pay for a cup of coffee. Back to Grand Canyon. It's my foreground example, but remember it's just an example. It's part of a national conversation about these same issues. As you can imagine, Grand Canyon is a dry place and water is crucial to everything that lives in the canyon. There's not much of it. There are 900 seeps and springs in the walls of the canyon, but they only take up less than one one hundredth of one percent of all of that terrain. They account, however, for 80 percent of the biological diversity, something like 500 times more biological diversity along the margins of those tiny water sources than in the whole rest of this very extensive national park. Meanwhile, the south rim of the canyon is the portal for most of its annual visitation of 5.5 million of us. And on the south rim, an Italian corporation has purchased some private parcels of land, and they have big plans for it. 2,200 homes, hotels, a resort, a spa, a dude ranch, a craft outlet, in all three million square feet of commercial space. If that were a shopping mall, it would be the third largest one in America. Never mind the congestion that that would visit on an already desperately overcrowded national park. Uh, never mind the aesthetics and the, um, and the noise and the impact on the visitor experience. The real threat here is water. There's already concern that the use of water up there on the south rim is depleting underground water resources that feed the life of the canyon. And this gigantic development proposal would quadruple water consumption on the south rim. Well, the U.S. Forest Service, our U.S. Forest Service, has to issue certain permits for that development to go forward because they have to allow access across national forest land. And in the waning days of the Obama administration, the Forest Service bowed to public pressure. Public pressure is very meaningful. And they said, no, we're not going to allow that access, so the development can't go forward. But we know that since then, the Italian government has interceded with the Trump administration and is lobbying to have the permits issued. And we know that our president has a certain affinity, you might say, for real estate development. So we're waiting to see what happens with all of that, too. Realistically, our national parks aren't going to see pump jacks and drill rigs and fracking. But all those other public lands, you might think of them as our great American outback, they seem much more obscure and much more taken for granted. And I hope we can bring them to the front ranks of public consciousness because they are now up for grabs. This is, this is Cambridge. It's a place of wholesome contentiousness. I don't want you to think I'm making a lot of assumptions about your point of view. Um, you may disagree with me about a lot of these things. But I want to anticipate that at least some of you might pose the question, what can I do about these issues? And I pose that question just like any of you would to the internet. What can I do to fight to protect America's public lands? So some of you will be gratified to hear that 
uh, got a broad and instantaneous result, 149 million results on the internet in 0.6 seconds. Um, most of them weren't too useful, but the first couple of screens were. They list many worthy and effective organizations uh, that are fighting these issues through. And um, if you're interested, they certainly merit your attention. As for me, I'm a fan of the Sierra Club, uh, and especially its dual agenda of fighting climate change and also fighting to protect public lands. And we'll be hearing more about the Sierra Club here momentarily. About 50 years ago, the biologist and sometime presidential candidate, Barry Commoner, coined a phrase that probably many of you have heard. It's now a cliche in the ecological sciences. In ecosystems, he said, everything is connected to everything else. In the politics of public lands, everything is also connected to everything else. But if you choose to fight this monster, most of us have to concentrate on one or two tentacles at a time. And so it's a fair question. What offers, what offers the best opportunity? Where is the most leverage? In my reconnaissance of these issues, I keep coming across the evidence that many of the ills of our public lands mismanagement stem from the influence of money, specifically political campaign contributions on our political and regulatory systems. No surprise for you in that, I'm sure. Private interests will always be poised to take advantage of rev revenue opportunities offered by national parks and public lands. And on some occasions, we citizens may decide that some of those uses are appropriate. But generally, we're too busy with the rest of life to monitor the national interest in detail in all of these different arenas. Instead, we expect, or we used to expect, to elect conflict-free and focused legislators who could represent the public interest instead of their donors' interests. Meanwhile, though, a large majority of us have lost faith in the legislative process. In a recent poll, 75% of a random sample of voters said that they think campaign contributions buy results in Congress. That's a margin of three to one. And Republicans were almost as alienated as Democrats when this question was asked. You may have heard of the Harvard law professor Lawrence Lessig. I guess he's a local hero to some. Um, he's also a sometime presidential candidate. Lawrence Lessig has written that puzzles plus money invite the view that the money explains the puzzles. In a line, he says, we don't trust our government. And the political scientist Dennis Thompson points out that merely because we've gotten used to large-scale campaign donations doesn't mean they're any less potent or any less corrupt than a legislator with a hand outstretched waiting for some money to pay for a vote. Indeed, Thompson argues that this kind of corruption is worse because we have grown used to it, it's legal, and we tolerate it. So it's doing every, even more damage he writes that citizens have a right to insist as the price of trust in a democracy that officials not give reason for us to doubt their trustworthiness. Well, to wrap up, public lands are our inheritance. We're the beneficiaries of our grandparents and great-grandparents. They fought off countless misguided and self-dealing privatization schemes to keep public lands in public hands. National parks or national forests, those aren't accidents of history. And we're going to have to continue that fight if we want to keep them. There's something else that we have to do, and sometimes it's not easy either. We have to keep up our hopes. That word hope, we usually think of it as a noun, and maybe as something like holding your breath and keeping your fingers crossed. But that kind of passive hoping, it's not so useful now. My favorite ecologist, David Orr, likes to say, hope is a verb with its sleeves rolled up. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Stephen. That was wonderful. Um, I'd like to now to introduce Michael Brun. He's the e executive director of the Sierra Club. He has been since 2010. He's considered one of today's most inspiring and effective environmental leaders. Under his direction, the Sierra Club has grown to three million members, and Brun is spearheading the drive to move away from fossil fuel fuels to 100% renewable energy. He's also wanting to maintain his protection of America's remaining wilderness. A nationally recognized commentator on energy and the environment, Brun is author of Coming Clean, Breaking America's Addiction to Oil and Coal. When he isn't campaigning, he's usually out hiking with his family, but tonight we're very lucky that he's here, and can we bid a warm welcome to Michael Brun? So, uh, as you just heard, I'm Michael Brun, Executive Director for the Sierra Club, and uh, look, I'm here to hopefully shine uh, a little bit of light in the darkness that is uh, the threat to our public lands, hopefully to inject a little bit of hope into the despair that some folks feel when they think about the assault on our air and our water and our climate and our communities and our public lands and our forests and our, uh, and our democracy. Um, but before I go any further, let me just uh, offer a sincere and heartfelt thank you to Mary Stack and to the Cambridge Forum for bringing us here together and continuing to shine a light on what's happening to our country these days. Uh, and in particular, also to Stephen Nash for your examination uh, of the threats to our public lands and uh, also for your call to action for, uh, for us all to work together to help protect them. So please join me in thanking you. So the issue that we're here to discuss today is one that is near and dear to the hearts of everybody at the Sierra Club. In fact, protecting the Sierra Club is one of the things that has helped to define our organization. My predecessor, David Brower, more than 50 years ago, uh, launched a campaign and led a campaign to urge the government to not build dams that would have flooded the Grand Canyon. And in the course of doing so, not only did he uh, inadvertently help the IRS to shape how it viewed grassroots activism, but he really built a model for grassroots-led, uh, creative and strategic and principled advocacy that shapes a lot of what the Sierra Club does today. Uh, and as Mr. Nash said, the assault on our public lands is just one prong of the assault that's coming from this administration uh, and its attacks on our environment. It's one prong of an assault on our climate progress that we had been making for many years before this administration took office. And it's one prong of an attempt to put the interests and the profits of a few at the expense of all of the rest of us. The Sierra Club, we have mobilized since the morning after the election in November of 2016 to resist the Trump agenda at every opportunity. Uh, we, this means that we have been mobilizing in the streets, uh, marching with hundreds of thousands and millions of others. We've been active in the courts. We have been active in the US Capitol. We have been active in the marketplace. We have been active in state houses. We've been active in city council meetings. And we have been there not just when the fight is to protect clean air, or to protect clean water, or to protect our climate, our communities, or our public lands. Our environmental law program has gone into overdrive. We have been very active in filing lawsuits almost at every single time that the Trump administration is launching an attack on the safeguards that protect our families, or every time that there's an attack against our public lands. We have taken this administration to court, and slowing or stopping each of these rollbacks. Our FOIA litigation, Freedom of Information Act litigation, against Scott Pruitt helped to expose the height of his corruption. Uh, whether it was finding emails about stories that 
he wanted to get a Chick-fil-A franchise for his wife, that he wanted to um, buy a mattress, a used mattress at Trump Tower, which is a scary thought, um, or that his lobbyists were planning taxpayer-funded trips to the Rose Bowl or um, uh, pasta-making classes in Italy. And as part of a united resistance, we have been there to fight for what is the best in this country um, by mobilizing to protect the communities and the families that Trump has targeted. We have been fighting against the Muslim ban. We have been fighting in solidarity with immigrant families. We have been fighting for women's rights. We have been fighting police brutality against people of color. We have been fighting and continue to fight to stop Kavanaugh. These, these are our families. These are our friends. These are our neighbors. These are Sierra Club members, often, that are under attack. And our mission at the Sierra Club is to protect the human and the natural environment. And we take that mission very seriously. We are proud to say that over the last two years, our base of supporters has grown from just a hair under two million to more than three and a half million members and supporters across the country. And every day, Every day that we are working to resist Trump on the federal level, we also know that there are some things that this president can't stop. Our Beyond Coal campaign has worked with hundreds of organizations, first to stop the construction of almost 200 new coal-fired power plants, and since then to help retire 270 existing coal power plants and replace them with clean energy. Since Trump's election, over 40 coal plants have been retired at the exact same rate as they were before he was elected. Let me say that one more time. Since Trump has been elected, more than 40 coal plants have been retired or will soon be retired, and this is happening at the exact same rate as before Trump was elected. 82 cities across the country have now made a commitment to move to 100% clean electricity as part of the Sierra Club's Ready for 100 campaign. Our environmental law program and our grassroots organizers are making progress stopping, stopping dirty pipelines and gas infrastructure all over the country. And with the success resisting Trump on the federal level and keeping momentum going in states and localities, I hope that you'll agree that there is hope. There is sunshine shining through the dark clouds of this administration. But the issue that we're here to talk about today is one where the fight is particularly difficult. It's particularly challenging. We are in the midst of the largest and most aggressive, most audacious push in our country's history to open up our parks, open up our public lands to dirty fuels development, oil and gas and coal and other forms of destruct destructive development and the consequences for our health, to the environment, to our natural legacy, could be irreparable. Every three months, there are new swaths of public lands that are being auctioned off. These are places, our treasured parks, our treasured places that are being sold out to industry by Secretary Ryan Zinke, steadily eating away at the places that we know and love. So working with local communities, the Sierra Club is challenging these attempts to open our public lands to mining, drilling, and fracking at every opportunity. The Sierra Club filed legal challenges to Zinke's illegal attempts to drastically shrink, shrink Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante National Monuments in Utah. And we're working with people on the ground to monitor any efforts to move ahead with dirty fuel development inside the original monument boundaries before the court makes, makes its decision. Sierra Club is also working with local communities to challenge new dirty fuel lease sales and to defend places like Chaco Canyon, Great Sand Dunes National Monument, the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, parks across Utah and the Grand Canyon, among many other places. We're pressuring corporations and banks to put people first and raising the social cost of doing dirty business. For example, we're targeting oil exploration companies like SAE Exploration, who are seeking to drill or to destructively uh, do destructive seismic testing in the Arctic Refuge. Our activists have submitted hundreds of thousands of comments across the country, held rallies, and met with elected officials and other decision makers at every level of government. Just as we did with Scott Pruitt, we're working to hold Zinke accountable 
for his abuse of power and for all of his destructive policies, particularly ones that exploit taxpayer dollars. And we're happy to see progress. We are actually making significant progress, not just in stopping coal plants, not just in stopping gas pipelines, not just in mobilizing millions of people and helping to revive and resuscitate and strengthen our democracy, but even within the Interior Department. We've seen Ryan Zinke back down on plans to raise park fees by 200%. He withdrew that idea. We've seen him cancel a program uh, that currently allows fourth graders to visit our national parks for free to make our parks more accessible. There was an attempt to cancel that program, and after public out outcry, he pulled that back. Zinke has delayed controversial lease sales uh, near Great Sand Dunes uh, in the greater Chaco region. He's scaling back plans to expand offshore oil drilling on both coasts. He even reversed his attempt to sell off parts of Bears Ears for private development, even though illegally they've attempted to shrink uh, Bears Ears National Monument by close to 90%. So together, we are sending a message to this administration and corporations that we, this loud and vibrant and diverse cacophony, are powerful enough to bring about a future that doesn't sacrifice our clean air, our clean water, our lands, or our families. Sierra Club has been around for 126 years. We have thrived under democratic administrations, Congress that was controlled by Democrats. We have thrived and made great progress when Congress was controlled by Republicans. We've been able to thrive under Republican presidents. We have never seen an administration that is this destructive to our public lands, to our environment, or to our democracy. But we will outlast this administration. And we, all of us, will emerge stronger from this ordeal. Thank you, everybody. Um, I'm kind of got mixed feelings about, I, I feel hopeful and depressed at the same time. The Italian resort being developed just, I couldn't believe my ears when you talked about that. It was beyond my belief. Um, and I do think building bridges is part of the answer, but when I, I read today about all the different lawsuits that are currently um, in progress against the Trump administration, you've got the Native Tribes, Patagonia, the clothing company, the Center for Biological Diver uh, Diversity, but we're up against people like the, you know, the Koch brothers, um, and I just wonder if our pockets and energy is deep enough and sustained enough to win out. What, what do you think? <laughs> well, I think that when the odds look tall, as you've described them, and it's not an inaccurate description, it really helps to remember where national parks and national forests and uh, national monuments came from. It isn't that the odds were any better 100 years ago. It was the age of the robber barons. It was the age of rapacity that easily overmatches the kinds of things we're seeing now, people found ways to stand up and blunt all of that and indeed force it back in the other direction. Um, sure, we had good leadership, but that good leadership depended on political support that is still there. There's plenty of evidence of that. And when we're talking about hope, it sort of has to be, it has to be titrated. If things look too great, then there's no reason for any of us to do much. But if they look too grim, then this kind of paralysis sets in. So the situation is hopeful as long as more and more of us get involved. Yeah, I would add that, well, first, to answer your question directly, of course we are more powerful than the Koch brothers, than this current president, than the administration, than people in Congress who want to take us backwards. And what I would say is that we are almost always overmatched. Before I talked about the coal plants that the Sierra Club and many other groups helped to stop being built. In every one, literally every one of those fights, the utility or the coal mining company or economic, certain economic interests always had more money. They always had some political support. We were always swimming against the tide to say, no, we don't want to see an, another coal plant that would 
poison this community for 50 years be built. We don't want to have an increase in greenhouse gas emissions when we need to decrease it. And each time, we organized. We knocked on doors. We held town hall meetings. We worked to build community forums to talk about alternatives to pollution. And we prevailed time and time and time and time again. In this country's history, the progress that we've made socially uh, and environmentally almost always starts where we are overmatched. It almost always starts in an instance where the community underdogs have to prevail against more powerful, what seem like more powerful opponents. Um, particularly when it comes to public lands, there is support and there is a constituency, a bipartisan, transpartisan constituency for protecting our natural legacy that runs deep in this country. There are, as Stephen was talking about, millions of people who visit our public lands and hundreds of millions of people who want to and who know that these are special places that ought to be protected. So while acknowledging that the threats to our public lands are severe, I think that we are seeing a, the strengthening of a movement that um, offers great hope to, for our prospects moving forward. Um, I, I take those points. I think they're very good points. I think what worries me is this time we've got a kind of a double threat because we've got the de regulations have just been lessened and laxed. I mean, you, we're undoing clean air, we're undoing clean water. Added to which, I was recently in California and in the Central Valley I saw these massive mega warehouses that Amazon are building and they run their diesel engines round the clock. The people are already poisoned in the Central Valley from working with pesticides and everything else. And it seems like they don't have a voice. These people, it's just, it just seems to be this huge wave of, uh, you know, this is the new normal. That's, I think, what worries me. How, how do you get back good regulation when it's all been undone? You can't just invent clean air when you, when you relax these standards. That, that, I think that's my huge concern on top of all the wilderness being cracked and developed? It's a valid concern, absolutely. But even 30 years ago, air quality was worse than it is now. And it was worse even than the Trump administration can make it. Even 20 or 30 years ago, water quality was in worse shape than it is now. Um, uh, wonderful examples like Boston Harbor or the James River down where I live. Um, all over the country, things have improved to such a great degree from circumstances that look just as grim as what you're describing. So yes, there's an effort to dismantle all of the good legislation uh, and, <laughs> and the good morale that brought that legislation about. Absolutely true, but it is also the case that these are these wonderful improvements are relatively recent, and they are the result of public pressure. Public pressure still works. Yeah, and I don't have any desire to try to diminish or dissolve any concern that you have. In fact, we could go tit for tat for an hour or two sharing concerns about what's happening in the world today. And you know, each day it seems like there is another assault on something that we hold dear the people that we love, or the places that we love. And so uh, I, I don't want to minimize that. The threats are real, and sometimes it seems as though they're compounding each other. Uh, and, then, and when you look at attacks on the media or attack, attacks on our democracy or other institutions that would enable us to address those things, it can, it can seem like these threats are compounding. I feel that myself, and I know that a lot of people in the Sierra Club do at the same time. What is also true is that from an environmental perspective and from a social perspective, uh, our values have changed. And we, we don't have to argue why clean air is important, like we had to 40 years ago when the Clean Air Act was being argued. In most communities, we don't have to talk about why clean water is important, regardless of your political persuasion, income level, race, ethnic, background, religious beliefs, people care about clean air and clean water, and despite what you hear from the president, increasingly there's a consensus around climate change. And so I feel as though when you look at 
public values and how they have shifted largely in our favor. And if you look at how most of the country is responding to these threats and by taking action, and when you see example after example of communities that are doing things positively, I think it can, it can create the confidence and the hope that's necessary to combat these very real threats. I want to thank both of you very much for coming. It's been a, uh, a wonderful talk and a, a kind of an eye-opener in the terms of rethinking. Uh, I've lived in about 10 states, mainly up and down the East Coast, a little bit in the Midwest, and grew up, let's see, my first environmental consciousness was in Maryland, saving the Chesapeake Bay. That went on for years and years. And um, so most of the environmental concerns that I've had have been sort of smaller in visions, like the Bay or like the Charles River. Uh, I've read a lot in, in about the uh, Everglades in Florida and the wildlife and the disappearing of that and water, water quality in some of the forest in Maine. So they've all been sort of local and recently some of the fishermen of uh, fishing concerns here in the Mideast with the lobster fishermen and with the different fisheries. And so these are all little pocket concerns and I've joined bandwagons and sent money and written letters for a lot of the little ones. But I wondered if there is any kind of listing that maybe the Sierra Club puts out of uh, environmental problems that are so critical that need to be dealt with now. You know what I mean, the uh, more urgent, a listing of the more urgent where I could send, send money or do marches or write letters. That would be very helpful, and I don't know, maybe you've already got that kind of thing. But uh, I would like to know what's critical, like some of these, I know the big parks, Yellowstone and Grand Canyon, and that, but there's so many smaller parks uh, that I've been concerned. I volunteer at the Longfellow House, and they have beautiful books on all the different parks, mm -hmm. and goodness, there are parks I didn't even know existed, and I think in certain parts of the country, mm -hmm. there's pockets of us that are concerned about our area, mm -hmm. but I've never been to either one of the big parks, mm -hmm. so I'd love to go sometime, but so that's been on the back burner, and sure. I'd love to know the criteria mm -hmm. of which, and is there a listing, and where might I find one? Yeah. So, well, first, thank you. Thank you for your interest in our parks and the special places locally and across, up and down the seaboard uh, and across the country, and thank you for your support and for writing letters and making contributions and doing all that you do. Uh, all of us depend on grassroots engagement. And the reason why many of these places were protected to begin with uh, is because of the activism of people like you. So thank you for that. And to answer your question, yes, we do provide lists of uh, the places that are most threatened. The, the mission of the Sierra Club is to explore, enjoy, and protect the planet. And we take each of those three things very seriously. We will alert our members and inform our members of opportunities to go out and explore some of the beautiful places in this country and around the world. We lead outings, uh, on a week, hundreds of outings on a weekly basis. And then we see our role for all of our supporters as being to identify when there is an urgent threat, when we can when we need all 3.6 million members and supporters of the Sierra Club to take action at a single time on a single urgent threat, uh, we ask people to engage. So yes, if you go to sierraclub.org, sign up, I can guarantee you we will send you alerts when, when your help is needed. Perfect, I, I will certainly do that. And I also want to just mention that just in the last week, it's been brought forward to us here in Massachusetts about the ice melt in the icebergs up in Alaska mm -hmm. because the seals are moving and we've, all, we've had this week a, a shark attack death because the sharks are following on our public beaches. Mm -hmm. They're moving down and as a result of what's going on up in Alaska. So mm -hmm. thank you. Thank you.
Um, hi, thank you for doing this research. Um, I grew up in Missouri, and my mother was very active with the Sierra Club there in the 1970s. Um, and when, as you were talking, I was thinking that it sounded like our government is subsidizing the um, greenhouse gas emissions um, based on the grazing and also the fracking on the public lands. And I thought of a, an article I read recently in the New York Times about the way in which the fracking companies have not actually made a profit. I don't know if you saw that article, but it was saying there was a potential economic crisis might be due to the fact that um, fracked gas is actually not a profitable industry. Mm -hmm. And so when I heard your talk, you're talking about us subsidizing them, and we're subsidizing a business that isn't profitable. Um, so that just really makes me concerned about this, and I wondered what what your comments or thoughts were about that. I also wondered, I had heard that um, Dick Cheney, this was a while ago, exempted fracking from the Clean Air Act. Mm -hmm. And I um, thought Obama was clamping down on that and wondered what the current status was. So those are my two questions. Thank you. Right. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I think it's another very hopeful thing that many of the policies of the current national administration that are very aggressively promoting the development of fossil fuels are falling completely flat. Because as you said, uh, in the case of natural gas in some circumstances, in the case of coal uh, resources in all circumstances, and it's true often with with oil energy, oil-based energy also, they're not economically competitive. Um, that's really, really true with coal. So th the whole idea of encouraging more exploration and development of coal isn't gonna go anywhere. There are special cases where companies can make money out of fracked gas, especially if it's energy companies that are in a position to force their customer base to use gas rather than what is quickly becoming a cheaper source of power, renewable energy. In those situations, you'll still see pipelines being constructed and you'll still see it fracking. Maybe Michael has an update on the relaxing of, I think it's methane emissions from, from fracking. Um, yeah, yeah, so I can share the Sierra Club's perspective on this. Um, a friend of mine used to have a bumper sticker that said, if you're not outraged, then you're not paying attention. Hmm. And on this issue, I think, I, I think of that bumper sticker because if you're, if you're not outraged at the destruction and degradation of our lands, our parks and our wilderness areas and our public lands from this dirty fuel development, uh, then perhaps you would be outraged by the fact that you're paying for it as a taxpayer. You are subsidizing, because this is at, often this is at below market rates to allow for oil and coal and gas companies to come in and degrade our public lands. And it is done for companies that often are not profitable. The, the op-ed in the New York Times documented how for many of these companies, the largest companies, they're not even able to pay back uh, they're not able to meet shareholder expectations or pay back their bonds and meet revenue pro projections. And it is true that fracking is exempt uh, often from the Clean Air Act, Clean Water Act, Safe Drinking Water Act, National Environmental Policy Act. All of these regulations don't govern the, the process of fracking. So under the Obama administration, several attempts were made to strengthen uh, the regulations on the fracking industry to begin not completely, but to begin to lower the impact from an environmental perspective on air and water and climate. And yes, uh, this administration, the Trump administration, is actively seeking to undo uh, each of those protections. I was wondering if either of you could uh, shed some light on the role going forward of state-level land, uh, state-level public land and conservation, 
Historically, states have been on the vanguard of conservation with um, Yosemite was a state park before becoming a national park. The Adirondacks preceded the Wilderness Act and Wilderness Protection by 80 years. And Boston's metropolitan park system was the first regional park system. So states have really been a leader in public land conservation. However, as Mr. Nash pointed out, it is a double-edged sword, whereas many states are trying to gain control of federal lands. Um, so again, how would you envision going forward uh, the role of states in sort of strengthening protections or as potentially weakening these protections? Thank you. I mentioned uh, campaign finance, which may not seem directly connected to conservation issues, but I think in many cases, uh, in very many cases, it is. Campaign finance reform is somewhat stymied at the federal level, just somewhat. There are still uh, avenues of approach to doing something about that, and it would help public lands uh, and renewable energy development to do it also. But at the state level, there are even more approaches, I think, to campaign finance reform better ways, more effective ways in the immediate future to put pressure on our political representatives to get themselves unhooked from the kinds of corporate forces that are exploiting public lands. Um, lots of good experiments underway in public uh, financing of campaigns, lots of good experiments underway to push back on the unfortunate Supreme Court rulings that have made this national mess of um, money influence in politics. And I think the same is true for conservation efforts. Where I live in Virginia, public lands are being used um, in part to enable a couple of completely useless multi-billion dollar frack gas pipeline projects. I think that the effort to stop them at the state level uh, while it hasn't yet been a complete success, has been successful beyond anybody's wildest dreams. The federal leverage wasn't, um, wasn't completely missing, but it wasn't, those, those levers weren't as immediately available. So it's been, uh, so far, a wonderful success story. The pipelines are, one of them is, is halted for the time being, the other one's going forward, but over a lot of state-level opposition. So, I think people identify with these issues in their backyards very strongly, and I, I, I think that's a going concern. I agree with Steve, certainly, on um, the opportunities for state leadership on campaign finance reform. We're seeing that already, uh, as well as on strengthening voting rights. Uh, and clearly on the energy side of environmental issues, that's where we're making the most progress, at the state and at the city level. Uh, California just made a commitment to move to 100% clean electricity and to go to net zero across uh, the state economy. Hawaii has done the same. As I mentioned, 80 plus cities have made commitments to move to clean energy. But when it comes to public land protection, the innovative and visionary state level or city level policies that you're talking about, uh, we are, we're looking for that kind of leadership. It's not as evident at the state level uh, within our state forests. Most of what we're seeing uh, are more negative examples of either allowing fracking on state forest lands in Pennsylvania or allowing pipelines in other places or the advocacy of a lot of states, particularly the states in the West that are looking to uh, uh, seize uh, federally owned lands and transfer them to state ownership. We, we could use, we're seeing great leadership on the energy side, but we could use stronger leadership in terms of our defense of public lands. It, it seems like a lot of the discussion on uh, the public lands seems to be about um, fossil fuel extraction, but I was wondering about renewable energy development and if there's any current or uh, potential development of renewable energy on these public lands, and uh, what your take on that would be. Uh, is it worth uh, sacrificing ever, you know, the natural beauty and uh, biodiversity for, for renewable energy, or is there even a concern if that? 
A couple of examples of energy development on public lands that makes sense if it's done carefully. Um, Large-scale solar installations in California on public lands and in Nevada, uh, they're welcome as long as their financial um, sort of uh, infrastructure uh, that allows those things to happen benefits us taxpayers and protects the land. So, um, so solar arrays on public lands in California and Nevada are a great thing because they replace fossil fuels. They have to be done very carefully because there are species, uh, the endangered desert tortoise is a primary example, that um, if you encroach on their habitat with solar arrays, it has, it has bad consequences. Similar with wind power, if it's not well sited on public lands, and there are some examples of it on national forests, there's habitat destruction from that. It, it takes a lot of roads and pipelines and, and conduits and things. And yet, um, and yet the, in the process of thinking through how to do that carefully, there's a, a great deal of positive advantage. So um, a, a third example is wind power on, uh, I guess you could call them public lands, but they're, they're sub-aquatic public lands off the Atlantic <coughs> coast. They've been surveyed, so we know where the sensitive areas are now on the ocean floor of the Atlantic on the continental shelf. We know where we can put those those windmills uh, to, to, to make renewable energy. And those things are going forward. What has to be watched, though, is how they are monitored, how they're designed, and, and how they're put in place. We don't want to lurch toward renewable energy in a way that's destructive of the very kinds of things we're trying to protect from fossil fuels. Yeah, I, pre I really appreciate that question. You know, I, I started at the Sierra Club in 2010, and one of the first and most challenging controversies to deal with were uh, a series of decisions on whether or not we should oppose a few of these solar uh, farms that we were just uh, hearing about. And the context for this, of course, was that this was years after eight years, uh, it was after eight years of the Bush administration where we were moving backwards on clean energy development and on climate change, and there was this pent up frustration at the lack of action and the need to see the federal government be much more aggressive in terms of promoting clean energy. And of course, the climate crisis was becoming more clear and more severe. And so there was a push from across the community to really expand clean energy development as quickly as possible. And yet, a few of these proposals for large-scale developments in the desert uh, we knew would have an impact on endangered or threatened species. And we didn't, so we had to balance the rapid deployment of clean energy and supporting an industry that was still in its earliest phases with upholding values that Sierra Club members had had for decades. And many of our volunteers had worked for literally for decades to protect some of these places uh, that were under threat. And so we, we ended up opposing a few of these projects after much anguish. Uh, it, it, it pained us to say, no, we think that a few hundred megawatts of clean, renewable solar power shouldn't happen. And we litigated against a couple of these projects, uh, even though we were supporting hundreds of other projects, because we wanted to do it right, and we wanted to do it in a smart way. So after those, we began working very closely with the Obama administration, the Department of the Interior, to set up a red light, green light, yellow light system, basically, where areas that had high sensitivity, either culturally or biologically, uh, should be off limits to renewable energy development. Places where we knew it would be dangerous to go, we would at least want to slow a process down and think very carefully about whether renewables should go in that place. But we also wanted to identify those places where we knew the impacts wouldn't be severe. Maybe there, it was near where there was transmission lines anyway, where economically and ecologically it seemed like a good idea so that we wouldn't be slowing down the rapid development. And I would say that over the last eight or 10 years, we have seen a change in that renewable energy development companies now are much better at siting both solar and wind. And they're finding that a lot of the bureaucratic role um, Roadblocks have been removed in the process. 
Thank you so much. Thank you. Can you, can you comment about the American wild horses on the public lands and why there's such a drive to remove them from the, by of course the ranchers, the BLM, the DOI, and as, is it not true that they are not damaging the public land at all, but the cattle and sheep? But it's a fraught question um, because because wild horses are very charismatic. They do have a damaging effect on public land. There is a case to be made, however, that, um, that ranchers, in trying to get rid of populations of wild horses, are excusing the damage that their grazing cattle do. The, the, for me, the foundation problem here is that scientists, ecologists who study rangeland management, not with an eye toward deriving optimal economic interest from it, but with an eye toward, toward um, sustaining that as wildlife habitat, their voices are not being heard in these federal agencies. They're the ones whose data uh, can help us come to rational decisions about how many wild horses, if any, are sustainable. Um, and, and I think they've already reached their conclusion, and we already have the data about cat, cattle. Um, it's not sustainable to graze cattle in an arid environment. But horses can also damage the e ecosystem to the, to the disadvantage of um, uh, native wild species, and so they do have to be managed. They're very good at populating. How does that comport with the Sierra Club? <laughs> Uh, Ian Evans, freelance journalist, uh, thanks for being here. And I was wondering, with constant news about Trump and politics and one big story after another, how, as both an author and you know the Sierra Club, how are you trying to break through that noise to get the public to listen to these issues? How are we trying to do that? Good question, Ian. I was hoping maybe you'd give us a softball to close. <laughs> well, this is one way here tonight. Um, <laughs> how are we trying to do that? <laughs> we are um, trying to bring some decency into our dialogue. We're trying to find a way to separate ourselves from this president. Uh, to highlight real and practical solutions that are available today, to highlight real-world examples of people who are bringing those solutions to bear uh, and into the marketplace. And we are trying to find a way to connect with voters, regardless of their political persuasion, on values that we share. Uh, we believe very deeply, as I said earlier, that most Americans care about air and water and parks and our forests and our climate, and certainly our, our communities. And we know that a lot of the attacks coming from this administration threatens the things that Americans hold dear. So we try to find a way to communicate directly with people who politically might have a different uh, set of loyalties, but underneath those commitments, there are values that bind us all together. Thank you. Okay, well, um, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Michael, thank for you. this very engaging and uh, informative discussion on tonight's topic. Uh, we are now going to have a book signing with uh, Stephen Nash's book, uh, Grand Canyon for Sale. Um, and before you go, I want to remind you that next Wednesday is the next forum, which is going to be Chris Hedges, Chris Hedges, which is a coup, um, speaking about his latest book, Don't Get Too Depressed, America, The Farewell Tour. Um, and he's going to be having a conversation with Chris Lydon, who presents uh, WBUR's Open Source. So that should be lively, to say the least. And before you go, as well as dropping something in the hat, you can pick up a list of all this, the Cambridge Forum events till the end of the year. And I look forward to seeing you at all of them. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you.